Okay, good morning. Um, our next speaker is Professor Chris Holmes from University of Oxford, UK. Um, Professor Holmes have a joint professorship at the Department of Statistics uh, and the Department of Medicine. He's also the scientific director for the health program at the Alan Turing Institute in London. And Professor Holmes' research explores the potential of computational statistics and statistical machine learning to assist in the medical and health sciences. Uh, he oversees a research group working on probabilistic models and Bayesian decision analysis in complex biomedical data environments. Today, Professor Holmes uh, will talk about Bayesian nonparametric lear uh, learning through randomized loss functions. So, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, Stephen Walker from UT Austin, long-term collaborator, and two students uh, from Oxford, Simon Lydon, who's now graduated, and Edwin, uh, Edwin Fong. And I guess the interesting part is this: the story I'm going to tell you was a piece of research that emerged when we were trying to solve a different problem, yeah? So I'm really interested in something called model, what ha inference under model misspecification. Uh, and that's particularly problematic if you're Bayesian, because as I'll come on to say, if you're, if you're updating using Bayesian statistics, you're kind of implicitly or actually explicitly assuming that the model is true, yeah? And, and nowadays, as we try and build more complex models, you know, in my work in the health domain, we're trying to combine like genetic information with medical images. These models get really complex. Yeah, the data is really high dimensional. A and so increasingly you worry about the validity of the model, of the probabilistic model. And therefore you worry about what, is, what does it mean if you're making probabilistic statements of uncertainty. And, and we were trying to crack this problem using a technique in something called general Bayesian inference, and it was proving really problematic. And we thought, oh, maybe this other little technique can help. And then actually this other little technique, which I'll tell you about today, turned out to be much more interesting than the kind of original uh, approach we were using. Uh, so just an overview uh, of the discussion. Um, really at the heart of this is the Bayesian extension of the bootstrap, yeah? So I imagine that everybody uh, in this audience will know of the classical bootstrap, Efron's bootstrap. And so we know that that's a kind of a, a non-parametric approach to inference, to making valid kind of statements of uncertainty under certain conditions. And essentially, we're going to explore the Bayesian analog of that. Um, and I guess the, the, the twist to this, there's a whole field, a really interesting field of Bayesian non-parametrics. There's a great session this afternoon um, on non-parametrics, I recommend uh, you go to it and learn more. Um, I guess the interesting twist in this talk is we're going to actually use them Bayesian non-parametrics to train parametric models. So, so we have Bayesian non-parametrics, which kind of provides inference in its own right. We're, we're going to use structures from Bayesian non-parametrics to, to train to, and make statements used in parametric models. And I guess that's a kind of a kind of an unusual, slightly unusual approach. And, and it really goes back to this paper by Newton and Raftery in 94, which is an RSS red paper. And they, uh, they, they proposed this approximate approach to Bayesian inference. They called the weighted likelihood bootstrap. So, you know, if we go back uh, to the 1990s, um, you know, what's that, like kind of 30 years or so, uh, 25-ish years, uh, people were kind of struggling with how to do the computation, essentially, of Bayesian inference. You know, if you, if you, if you move away from the conjugate priors, from the standard updated, um, and they came up with a computational approach called the weighted likelihood bootstrap. And it got, if you read the discussion, it got a pretty, it was a pretty fierce discussion, yeah, of the paper. So a lot of people took it, kind of took issues with it. And it kind of, it's got a lot of citations, but it's laid pretty dormant. And we went back to that paper and we looked at it as a model in its own right. 
Yeah, so, we, so rather than thinking about this bootstrap as an approximation to something you would try and do, we said, well, let's just look at it as a model in its own right, and what are the properties of it? And it turns out, I think, uh, I would argue, that it's got really interesting properties. Actually, much better than the, than, the, uh, than the original kind of Bayesian properties that it was trying to approximate. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss that, particularly in this whole, the whole talk is about model misspecification. Uh, and one really nice kind of side issue is that it's incredibly fast, this bootstrap approach, and it's intrinsically parallel. Yeah, and so on modern computer architectures, as soon as you hear parallel, you're in, because we now have GP, these graphical processing units, which are designed to do fast parallelization. Yeah. And I'll provide you some, some examples, uh, some toy kind of examples using kind of standard data sets, and a real example from a, a large-scale genetic association study that we're involved in. Okay, and then I'll conclude. Okay, um, so just to get us all on the same page, get us kind of uh, working up is, so here's the classical kind of Bayesian updating uh, model, which says that, as we know, that the posterior distribution, uh, having seen data x1 to xn, n data points, is proportional to the prior, what you knew about theta before you saw the data, times the updating <coughs> um, function, which is the likelihood. We're gonna call that the likelihood function. Yeah, and that gives me a prosperia, and this is a well-characterized prescriptive updating rule. Yeah, it's prescriptive because it says if you want to adhere to certain uh, axioms of coherency and rational decision-making, you have to update your beliefs using this formula. Yeah, it's kind of optimal. Uh, it's kind of an optimal way of doing information processing. Yeah, so you are forced into this rule. Yeah, um, and in this sense, what this object here, this probability measure here, characterizes your subjective uncertainty. Here comes the big caveat in the room about the true unknown value of theta that gave rise to the data. Uh, that's, really, that's a really important kind of statement for this talk, because when you, when you see the kind of conventional Bayesian posterior, that's your beliefs about, you believe there was a true theta under which the likelihood generated the data that you're observing, yeah? And then this measure here characterizes where you think, having seen the data, it kind of tells you information about which value of theta it was, yeah? You had your prior about which value of theta generated the data. You've seen some data, you update that. And, and that's the kind of, it's, it's this thing here we're trying to tackle, or at least kind of accommodate this, this lack of a true value of theta. So whilst I refer to this as a likelihood function, just kind of subtly different to the conventional likelihood function, it's a full sampling distribution. So it's a normalized generative probability distribution. And that model represents the joint probability of observing the data. And all probability statements made by Bayesians or people presenting Bayesian results are predicated on the validity of the model. And you know, we all know all models are wrong. And so where does that leave us in interpreting uncertainty statements using that object here? So if I do a conventional Bayesian analysis, I present you with a posterior, what does that actually represent? if the model's uh, not true. And, and moreover, if you're gonna take that kind of characterization of uncertainty in theta and make decisions from it, should I treat this patient or not? Yeah, should I gather more data or not? Then, you know, all of those are kind of in some sense kind of predicated or dependent on the validity of the model or at least how close it is to being kind of valid. Okay. And, and this is problematic. Maybe if you went back, you know, again, 20, 30 years, if you're working with simple data, what we call kind of homogeneous data, you can get pretty close. You could think, well, you know, I can get pretty close on that model to something that might represent kind of nature's true generating process. But, but nowadays, statisticians are faced with much more complex situations. You know, so in my kind of world, in my, uh, you know, applied work, we might be looking to combine medical images with genetics, with electronic health records on patients, trying to build a joint probability model over the space of all of medical images and genomes 
and electronic health, longitudinal health records is completely fanciful. Yeah. So we really are into kind of like kind of really approximations. And you know, I don't need to tell you, and you're probably sitting there going, yeah, you know, move on. Because of course, you know, like models are by the very name, just simply models. You know, nobody's pretending that they're kind of true. And and the reason we use a model is we just want to capture salient features of the underlying generating process, and we want to be able to ignore, we want to be able to concentrate on the things we care about, yeah, for making inference statements or making predictions, uh, and, and kind of uh, move out of the space of things that we don't kind of care about. And it's a fanciful thing to do ever. However, formally speaking, uh, all of Bayesian statements are made under a principle that the model space is true. So, if the model's not true, yeah, what happens if you fit a false model or a misspecified model to, to data, yeah? So, if you just proceed in a, under a kind of a Bayesian update, we're going to imagine a world, you've chosen a model, you're kind of implicitly assuming it's true, and I'm going to give you more and more data, yeah? So, uh, we're going to go... We're going to say the data set's going to get larger and larger. I'm going to give you more and more information. That's a good thing, yeah? Getting more, you know, information. And we just want to look at what happens to your model as I give you more information, as if I give you more data. And, and the object we're going to consider is, is this kind of, uh, whoop, uh, is the maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, been there, been there, yeah, here. Uh, is this MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate, which is the, the arg max under the log likelihood function. So this is the probability of the data written as a function of the unknown theta. And here's the MLE. And so if we think of this as just fitting a model to data, irrespective of whether it's true or not, yeah, I just think of this as a score function. Yeah, so I think of the log likelihood, rather than having some special properties that it generated the data, I'm just going to think of it as a score function. And then it's perfectly valid, of course, to think of what are the properties of this left-hand side, yeah, outside of the validity of the model. I don't need to think of the validity, I don't need to consider the validity of the model to ask questions about this estimator here. Okay. And just a caveat, everything I'm going to say today is going to kind of in assume that the log likelihood factorizes, yeah, namely that we're going to have conditional independence of the data given the value of theta. That's a really important caveat that, of course, is not general, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna keep to that, that story here. OK. So as, again, is kind of well known to, to, to statisticians, as more and more data arrives, for most regular models, this MLE is going to kind of converge to a point. Yeah, so your confidence intervals are going to get tighter and tighter. If you're Bayesian, your posterior credible intervals are going to get tighter and tighter. You're going to converge to a point. And, and it's a special point, yeah? Because we know that where the model is heading to is theta naught, yeah? So that's what we're going to call the target. If I was to give you more and more data, your posterior distribution is going to converge tighter and tighter around theta naught. And so this says, for data arriving from F0, you don't know F0. That's kind of nature's true data generating mechanism. Yeah? So these are the, this is the true sampling distribution that's providing you data. So th that's providing you with data, and you're updating. Yeah? And we know for Bayesian models with reasonable priors and support, regular models, the posterior distribution is kind of going to, in a non-technical sense, going to head to a kind of a Dirac function. So it's going to concentrate its pro probability measure around this point here. And this is the expected model-based log likelihood under the unknown true data generating mechanism of the data. Okay. So another way, and perhaps if you haven't seen this before, kind of for, for junior researchers to think about this thing here is what happens under an infinite sample size? Okay. So if I have your data, which is arising from the unknown, nature's unknown and never known sampling distribution. Yeah, so XI, your data points are arriving out of this process F0, and you're going to fit 
say your model is maximum likelihood, log likelihood, yeah, under an infinite data set is going to tend to this theta naught. And as, 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 as is well known, that theta naught has a special place, which is it minimizes the kullback leibler divergence between your model distribution, f theta, and nature's true f naught. So what, what's this say? And this is well known since the kind of the work of White. So irrespective if your model is true or not, if your model is true, the kullback libel is zero. Yeah, you, you, your model will converge around nature's true data generating mechanism, which is within the support of your model space. But if your model's not true, if the model's misspecified, you will tend towards the closest point in the model space, in theta space, that minimizes, that makes that kind of divergence measure between your model and nature in a kullback leibler sense as small as possible. Okay. So that's a good thing. Yeah? We can understand what is happening under model misspecification yeah? or under, under well-specified model. Well, what your posterior distribution is doing is I provide you more and more data is concentrating around theta naught. Okay. So this, here we're going to need a kind of conceptual jump now. We're going to now kind of move out of conventional Bayesian updating, which is to say, um, and this is, this is, sorry, this is important, this, this part of the talk. <laughs> Hopefully most of it's important, but, but this part is kind of particularly uh, important, which is uh, that if theta naught is where you're heading, whether you like it or not, yeah, even if you're a diehard, but no, I believe in my model, and there's nothing that you can do to persuade me otherwise, yeah, is that you're heading there whether you like it or not. And therefore, what we're now going to think about of the prior on theta is not on the nature's on the true data generating mechanism. Yeah, I'm just going to think about that prior as where you're going to concentrate. So now my belief says if I put prior probability measure alpha on an interval, how do I interpret that? I say, well, subjective belief, so with probability alpha, I think if you gave me enough data, yeah, the posterior would converge with it into a point within this interval. Okay, that's conceptually very different to the Bayesian uh, prior. And so this is something that we de dealt with in an RSSB paper uh, with Stephen and uh, Bissery in 2016 about this idea of thinking of a general Bayesian update that makes statements yeah, on these kind of uh, minimization uh, parts. Okay. So we've got finite data arriving from F0. We don't know F0. And we want to quantify uncertainty in what is the value if you gave me an infinite data set. Yeah, what would that value be? We got prior information. Yeah, you could just update using a conventional Bayesian update, standard Bayesian update, put it into STAN, hit return, get your MC, get your samples out. Uh, but this assumes the model class is true. So what I want to do is to be able to do an update that doesn't make that assumption. Yeah. And what I'm going to argue is that bootstrapping or Bayesian bootstrapping can help me get from this left-hand side, this prior now on where theta naught is, the right-hand side even, to the left-hand side. Yeah, so we're going to use a bootstrap to update a prior. In the above story about this theta naught and about where you're converging to, yeah, where is theta naught? That's, that's the target. That's what we're trying to hunt down. That's what we're trying to make statements about. Yeah? So in that story, the uncertainty in theta naught arose because you didn't know F naught, yeah? Let's just go back here. If I told you F naught, yeah, I said, actually, here's F naught, yeah, here's nature sampling distribution, you'd walk away, you'd say, right, I've solved it. I don't need to do the Bayesian update. Just calculate this arg max and I'm done. Yeah, that's the optimal update because it would be as if you were updating with infinite sample size. Yes, yeah, so if I told you F0, there's no uncertainty in, in theta, in the optimal value of theta. Yeah? You don't know F0. So, but being Bayesian, we can place a non-parametric prior directly on F. Yeah? 
And this is the bit about using non-parametrics to train parametric models. Here, we're going to put a prior directly on the space of distribution functions rather than on theta. Yeah? So rather than putting a prior on the parametric model and then updating using Bayesian statistics, standard Bayesian update, I'm going to put a prior directly on f. Yeah? And learn about theta naught that way. And that's what the essence of this kind of Bayesian non-parametric learning. We're going to use a Bayesian non-parametric prior on f to train a parametric model. Yeah, using a kind of a generalized bootstrap. Okay, so because this is why we, one might want to do it, this, yeah, if you can sample a distribution from this thing here, now, now this is now, this isn't looking at, a, this isn't a model on this parametric form on the likelihood function. Yeah, this is a model for nature's sampling distribution directly. And the reason is, is that if I can put a, if I can put a, an update or learn about a posterior distribution over Fs, then I can then train my model in the following way. I can use Bayesian non-parametrics to first of all sample the distribution function directly from the posterior. So this now looks at a, a, as a draw from the posterior distribution on F, not on theta, on F given X. Because for every F, there's no uncertainty in the theta. Yeah, because if I update the theta, that should just, that shouldn't be a naught, yeah? If I update the theta given the fi, it's just an optimization. Yeah, and that's quite nice as well, because what I've now changed is rather than what might be a kind of a sampling problem, how to sample the, from the posterior, I've replaced that with an optimization. If I can draw this f from an object here, then I've got an optimization task on my hand. And if I draw a different f, I get a different theta, typically, yeah, in generality. Okay. Repeating this operations, if I can draw you multiple values, multiple distribution functions from this posterior, I'm going to get multiple thetas out. Yeah? And that's going to give me a bag of Monte Carlo samples that's now going to characterize this new distribution function, p tilde theta. It's not the same as the Bayesian update. That assumes the model's true. Yeah? I'm not going to assume the model is true, and I'm going to model nature's generating process directly, and then use that to learn about theta. Okay. So what's the simplest kind of model that you could use? Well, the workhorse of Bayesian non-parametrics is the Dirichlet process, so that's an obvious place to start. Uh, and the, the Dirichlet process is characterized by a base measure, G, a prior centering distribution, and a concentration parameter that says how much do you believe that the posterior will be concentrated, will be close to G. Okay. It's well known that if we take a degenerate form of the Dirichlet process, kind of bear with me on this bit, if you don't know anything about this, it'll hopefully become, the reason why you do this is because of what get, comes out the other end, yeah? So if we take a degenerate form with alpha tending to zero, then this Dirichlet process plays a discrete random measure. It, it, it assumes a discrete probability distribution, which puts atoms only on the observations. Yeah, that's going to help us a lot yeah, in what happens. As if you do that, it leads to a really simple form from the update of this. Remember, I have to try and solve this expectation. But if this thing on the right-hand side is just a discrete measure, yeah, then this thing, of course, just becomes a sum over the atoms which have support under F. And that's the Bayesian bootstrap. Yeah, alpha zero is the well-known kind of Rubin's Bayesian bootstrap. So it's a Dirichlet process, a degenerate Dirichlet process of alpha zero. And what it does is it leads to a really surprising update result, which says if you draw a random measure from the posterior of a DP of alpha zero, i.e. a Bayesian bootstrap, then the optimal value of that theta is just a simple weighted maximization. Yeah, so that's just a weighted log likelihood. Okay, so with stochastic weights at sum to one. So it's, it's a kind of a remarkably simple algorithm that says if I draw n weights from a Dirichlet, uniform Dirichlet, repeatedly, independently in parallel, and kick out this object here, yeah, 
the bag of samples, these theta tildes from just performing this weighted maximization have some really interesting properties because it's akin to doing a Bayesian update where you haven't assumed that the model is true, but you've put a prior directly on the unknown distribution function. What's also interesting is this is a, just as an algorithm. In fact, they use unit exponential weights, but if you standardize those, then you get the Dirichlet. Has been derived in a completely different sense in non-Bayesian, actually, as a way of getting valid uh, confidence intervals. Yeah, so this kind of algorithm of taking, of kind of shaking the data, taking a kind of a randomly reweighted objective function using unit exponentials, i.e. akin to a Dirichlet 111, yeah, it gives you something really interesting in the properties of those samples. Yeah. This is a bootstrap. Yeah, what I've described is a bootstrap. It's Rubin's Bayesian bootstrap. And so people will be very kind of familiar with Efron's, you know, the classical bootstrap. And just to kind of one slide, just to draw kind of the analogy and the differences is the classical bootstrap conditions on the empirical CDF, F hat, and draws repeatedly with resample size, sample sets of one to n given F hat. And then what you do is you characterize the finite sample properties of the estimator. What would have happened to this estimate if I'd had a different data set of size n? Pop. Pop one out from this empirical CDF and maximize. Get an estimate. Repeat it again, repeat it again. And, and then the, the uncertainty things, the, the kind of the uncertainty quantification is on the property of the estimator for finite n. Yeah, how does this estimator perform for other data sets of size n? Whereas the Bayesian bootstrap draws a whole distribution function. Yeah, and it's akin to having then drawn a distribution function, you draw an infinite sample size. Yeah, so I draw an f and then I draw an infinite sample size. And then look at the distribution of the estimates theta hat given, it, given x1 to, to infinity, which of course is just a Dirac. Yeah? Uh, because that's the thing you would like to solve. Yeah? What I'd like to know is the uncertainty comes from things I, you know, I hadn't observed. I, if I really knew, if I really had an infinite data set, I'd know what to do. Yeah? I don't have that. But we can bootstrap that out by condition on the empirical CDF. And so that, so the Bayesian bootstrap captures the uncertainty in theta uh, that flows from uh, the uncertainty in f. Okay. And of course, if f is discrete, which it will be if we take a degenerate Dirichlet process, then we replace this kind of maximization over an infinite data set with just a finite maximization over the atoms, so the support of the, that distribution. So that makes it computationally really tractable. We're just doing a, a, an optimization. Yeah. Optimization, by the way, is much easier than trying to sample from a distribution function. There's a huge amount of work in the literature of people working on optimization algorithms. And, and so it's an easier task in its own right than trying to do, for example, sample from a distribution. That's an aside. Though. OK. So, this form of using the Bayesian bootstrap to then fit a model had been proposed back in the, the early, well, mid-90s. Yeah? So there's this algorithm called the weighted likelihood bootstrap. It was an RSSB red paper by Newton and Raftery in 94. And they said, I've got a Bayesian model. Back in 1994, people were struggling with how to do Bayesian inference. Yeah? So they didn't have Stan. Uh, there wasn't wind, wind bugs might have been around actually, but you know Stan certainly was, and we didn't know about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. We didn't know about all these kind of amazing techniques. Yeah, so we had the Metropolis Hastings algorithm and Gibbs sampling. That was about it. And 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 what wait and what Newton and Raftery said. Oh, hold on a second. You know, there's this kind of interesting algorithm here that means that we could actually take a weighted likelihood log likelihood like a weighted log, log likelihood function, maximize it. And just keep doing that. And let's look at this bag of samples theta as an approximation to my Bayesian update. Yeah? So this is simply a reweighted data maximization. The model is fit. You did a weighted representation. The weights are stochastic that we just said. They're Dirichlet, uniform Dirichlet. And they said, look, this captures the kind of, 
kind of approximate Bayesian model in its own right. And in the great tradition of the Royal Statistical Society, they invite you to give a red paper, and then people completely pan it. They're like, you know, this, you know, what happens? They invite you, and then in the discussions, you know, it's, it's no holds barred. You know, everybody kind of gets in there and, and writes their view. And it's fair to say that this paper is worth reading. There's a pretty vibrant, let's call it, discussion of this paper. And so the paper, the red paper, led to, let's call it a vibrant discussion. And some of the key points were raised in the following, which are kind of all valid. Uh, first of all, they said, well, you know, hold on a second. The weighted likelihood bootstrap is a first order approximation to the Bayesian posterior. Whereas it was a bit of a kind of unfortunate in the timing because Gibbs sampling and MCMC was just kind of emerging on the scene. So they said, well, you know, I could use this weighted likelihood bootstrap to kind of do my update. But look, there's this amazing new kind of technique in MCMC and Gibbs sampling, which will give me the exact answer. So why would I want to use this thing here, you know, when I can do it exactly using MCMC? The other thing they didn't like it was, it didn't, it's not really very Bayesian, is it? There's no prior, yeah? So like one of, you know, one of the characteristic features of being Bayesian is a prior, and there's no prior at the moment. So, so that's another thing that might kind of wrangle you a bit. And the other thing is the small sample properties are not very good because you're bootstrapping. Yeah, so if I only have like five observations and I'm conditioning on those, that discrete measure at those five atoms, yeah, you don't really capture the uncertainty. And actually, the less data you have, the less uncertainty there is. That's another thing that seems a bit, <laughs> seems a bit in reverse. Yeah, it should be less data, the more uncertainty. Yeah. Um, so they said, oh, it's kind of very unbayesian. Uh, on the positives, it's unbelievably fast. Yeah, because you can give, I can give you a posterior sample in parallel for the time it takes me to do one maximization, one stochastic optimization. Yeah, so I just have to draw unit exponentials and maximize the weighted log likelihood, and I'm done. And I can do that trivially in parallel. So you can give me tens of thousands of samples yeah, for the, for the time it takes to do one maximization. So it's very, very fast. There's no burn-in, yeah, because it solves it exactly. There's no convergence diagnostics. So th that's a good thing, yeah? Uh, the challenge was these things here. We looked at this algorithm again. Actually, as I said, the story at the beginning, we were trying to solve a different problem. We were working on this approach for, called general Bayesian learning, and we didn't know the learning rate. So we had a way of kind of constructing this posterior. We were trying to deal with misspecified models, and we kind of knew what this posterior should be doing. It should be kind of learning. It should be concentrating. But we didn't know how fast. Yeah, and so we were stuck on it. Yeah, so me and Stephen, I think it's fair to say we were stuck on it. We didn't quite know how to specify this learning rate. And then we kind of went back and said, well, hold on a second. I wonder if this algorithm, this kind of basic non-parametric algorithm, could give us some insight into the learning rate when you're outside of the mo in something called M open. So if you don't have the true model, it's an interesting thing, yeah? So if you, if you have the true model, you know how fast to learn. You know how to, to, you implicitly know how to weigh up the information in the data to the information in the prior, yeah? So if, you, if, if you're in what's called M closed, yeah, if you have the true model, Bayesian statistics is an optimal information processing system, yeah? And that goes back to the work of Zellner, who showed that there's no loss of information in the prior to the posterior update. It's kind of the perfect update, yeah? But that's only if you're in M closed, if you've got the true model. Otherwise, you don't know how, how, how quickly to learn. So we were using this. We went to this algorithm to say, oh, maybe it can tell us something about the learning rate. And then having studied the algorithm, we're going, oh, you know, we shouldn't be doing what we were doing before. This stuff looks like, uh, this algorithm in its own right looks really interesting. Uh, and the first thing is, let's look at criticism one, yeah? Criticism one said, back in 94, said, the weighted likelihood bootstrap is a really poor approximation, can be a poor, poor approximation to this thing here. But with maybe fresh eyes, you say, well, hold on, this is a bit weird, because 
you're criticizing this thing for being a poor approximation to this thing which is wrong. Yeah? So you're not, you don't have the true data generating mechanism. You are misspecified. And therefore, this object here is somehow, uh, is not necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah, because, because this object here, the Bayesian update, assumes you've got the true model and you don't. So the first thing it says is maybe you were being a bit too quick to criticize the weighted likelihood bootstrap for being a poor approximation to an incorrect model. Yeah. And it turns out that actually the weighted likelihood bootstrap has really good properties under misspecification. Yeah. So irrespective of whether the model is true, and of course all models are wrong. So if we start from a position that all models are misspecified, and if you've chosen your likelihood function, so you've chosen your model, you're about to update using Bayesian, like you put into STAN or do standard Bayesian update. And I say, well, hold on a second. Don't update it using conventional. Update it using this weighted likelihood bootstrap. We can show that the update with the weighted likelihood bootstrap has better properties than the thing you would have got if you'd updated using a conventional Bayesian approach. And in particular, it has better coverage. Yeah, so just for the purposes of time, I'm going to kind of skip over. Essentially, we say you show that you get correct frequentist coverage of your posterior credible intervals, irrespective if the model is right or wrong. Okay. And essentially, it uses kind of like the observed... Inf this is the take-home message. The, the weighted likelihood bootstrap obtains the sandwich covariance matrix. Yeah. So it gives a robust measure, irrespective of the model misspecification, on the coverage. Okay, so that gives you low, that gives you low frequency. Space. What's interesting is Bayes can learn either too quickly or too slowly. You kind of think, well, if the model's misspecified, you might think you've got more information than you have. So the, the conventional Bayesian posterior is too concentrated. It can go the other way. Yeah, a trivial example, if you're updating using a Poisson likelihood, yeah, and the data is really under dispersed Poisson, then there's more information in the data than you think you have, and you actually learn too slow. This, the weighted likelihood bootstrap, because it's a bootstrap, kind of self-corrects that. Um, the other really interesting one is in prediction, is that if I take a bag of samples that have been generated from the weight, weighted likelihood bootstrap, and I compare it to a bag of samples that have been generated, say, using MCMC, the bag of samples and the weighted likelihood bootstrap do better prediction, provably so. Yeah? So if you're looking at making a prediction for a future observation, yeah, you're better off, provably, using the weighted likelihood bootstrap than you are using the standard uh, update. And that's, again, a theorem in this paper. And there's this, it's a little bit, it's, it's surprising. This is not as well known as it should be, maybe. This paper by Pashiki in 2005 in Bernoulli. And it's a bit of a killer if you're Bayesian, because it basically says, if you compare Bayesian updating to just bootstrapping, bootstrapping gives you better predictions. Yeah, so if you're doing, if you're thinking about, oh, I do my Bayesian update because it kind of captures uncertainty, and then I'll, but I want to make a prediction. Yeah, this paper says for regular models, don't do that, bootstrap, and you'll get a better prediction, provably so, in a KL kind of sense. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip over this. So essentially what we said, the way to likelihood bootstrap, it learns at the correct rate, Bayes doesn't, and it's got provably better predictions. But it still has no prior. Yeah? It's still not really kind of very Bayesian. Okay. So how can we combine this with prior information? Um, the small sample properties we're kind of less worried about now because we're in a world of big data. Back in 94, maybe you were worried about only a small set of samples. We're now much more worried about having too much, not too much data, but you know, huge data sets. Um, the obvious thing is to say, well, what happens if I take the weighted likelihood part and I just add a log regularizer, log prior? That doesn't work. Yeah, and the reason you can see that doesn't work is that if you've got no data, you'd want to get back your prior, and you don't. Yeah. You've got no data, you're going to get back the maximum of this log penalty term. So, so just putting in a regularizer isn't going to work here. Um, the workaround that we have is to use this idea of synthetic data. So now we're going to have the real data, the data that you've got, 
and I'm going to replace the prior with synthetic data. And the nice thing about that is that it then puts the prior and the data on the same space. Yeah, once they're on the same space, we could kind of work with them through this maximization. So here's the trick. Uh, as an approximation, we're going to draw a theta from the prior. I'm then going to draw synthetic, kind of a synthetic data set from the likelihood function or from the generative model with that theta prime, sorry, theta prime drawn from the prior, plug in theta prime, draw me a pseudo data set of size t, t large, combine it with my actual data and bootstrap it. Yeah, and maximize. And so the bootstrap looks like this. I'm now maximizing this weighted real data part plus some kind of effective sample size on the prior times a weighting of all these kind of pseudo data. Yeah, so you can kind of see what happens. And the nice thing about this is that if you've got no data here, this thing's going to give you back the prior, essentially, for large enough t. So we're going to have this nice property that small sample sizes no longer kind of really affect us because we've got lots of data. It's synthetic, it's kind of synthetic data drawn from the prior. And we get back our prior for large enough t as we do it. So prior specification through synthetic data is what we're going to use. And, and this is what the kind of algorithm looks like. So it says, uh, draw prior synthetic data from the marginal of x under the prior Combine it with your real data, draw a Dirichlet, and maximize and repeat. OK, I'm going to have to move on quickly through. Um, there are different ways that you can choose uh, that, uh, the way of the synthetic data generator mechanism. Uh, here's, um, here's what it does in practice. Uh, this is a, a little simulation that I knocked up. No, I didn't. <laughs> I was saying to Ramses before. So this was done by a student of mine. I have no idea how he. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks kind of pretty and nice. So um, what's happening here, if you look at the, the left-hand side, this is the data. So these are the data points. I'm looking at linear regression. Here's my Dirichlet weights that are going bobbing up and down. And every time they go up, I just do that weighted maximization, and I record the linear line, yeah? I record the line. And then I repeat and I repeat. Um, this is done sequentially, but of course we can do this in parallel. Down here, if you kind of see this point, <laughs> I can't track it because it's independent. Yeah, this point's going to jump around all over, and it's going to build me up a posterior characterization of this weighted likelihood bootstrap. And the thing to note here is that, of course, these are independent draws that can be done in parallel. There's no dependence. There's no convergence diagnostics here uh, necessary. Okay. And this is what you end up with the end. So what we say is that this is a valid, uh, non-parametric, uh, credible intervals for the uncertainty in what would be the linear line, what would be the line of best fit under an infinite sample size. Yeah, not what's the true model, is what is the best fit in line under an infinite sample size. OK. And I said computation is trivially parallelizable. Um, I'm going to skip over this bit for the purposes of time. But essentially, when you're generating, is there a question? Yeah. Uh, well, the nice thing is, is that in some sense, it's, it's the optimization. That's the thing that might be challenges, challenging for high dimensional data. But you've just got to optimize this weighted log likelihood. If you can do that optimization, then that's the task, yeah? Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. So in high dimensions, you need that T, the, the synthetic data size, to be big. That is true. And that will slow you down. Because you're now doing an optimization over uh, N plus T. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to do this bit other to say that what we did is we took some variational Bayes models, which are well known to be good predictors but have really bad coverage, and we showed that you can correct them using uh, posterior sampling. So in other words, uh, here's the outcome, which is on a standard kind of German uh, credit set, is that on this right-hand side, this is what a variational Bayes approximation would give you, the blue. 
Yeah, and what we do is from the posterior bootstrap, we get the green. Yeah, and we can compare that to MCMC and the take home messages. We've generated a million samples in 20 seconds because everything's in parallel, uh, whereas it took 30 minutes for the MCMC to run. Okay. And so this is for logistic regression, essentially. The other interesting thing about it is that uh, because we're optimizing, we can mode jump. Yeah, there's no, there's no dependence in this chain, which means you don't get like, the issues that you have in MCMC is where you hit a local kind of mode and you hang around it and then you've got to jump out. Here, because we're doing separate parallel maximizations, you mode jump really efficiently. And so a well-known challenge in inference problem is in the k-component mixture model because of all the symmetries. There's, we know there's k-factorial symmetries in the data. So we're just going to look at a standard k-component uh, uh, Gaussian mixture model, which has Dirichlet weights and mixture of normals. And we're going to look at a 2D example. X is in 2D and K is just 3, just for illustrative purposes. And here's the kind of results. On the left-hand side is using Bayesian bootstrapping. Yeah, and what you can see is that the bootstraps capture all of these symmetries. We expect we expect a, an axis of symmetry through the line of identity because we know that you can just arbitrarily, there's label switching. You can switch the labels, you get the same model. And then here's the output from like the no U-turn sampler. So these are all MCMC type samplers. And, and they're just trapped. Yeah, and we know it's a problem for like mixture models. You get trapped in a local mode and then You've got to make a big jump, but you don't know quite know where to in order to get out. But this, because it's just independent maximizations, um, it's fast and it jumps around in space. Uh, and so, so finally, we've been using that this. We've been using the approach for, for in Oxford, we're really interested in the impact of genetics or understanding the genetic contribution to human disease. And something called GWAS, genome-wide association studies, are really popular, which means you take, it's a case control study typically, or it could be a prospective study. Take a group of patients with the disease, you take a set of match kind of controls without, you sequence their genomes, and then you look along the genome for, are there genetic variants which associate with the disease risk? So in some sense, it's just, it is just logistic regression but we have a very, very structured data set and a very high dimensional one. So we're going to look at a large scale genetic association model uh, where it's logistic regression. We're going to put a student prior on the coefficients of that so that it's kind of heavy tailed. Um, we use UK Biobank. Uh, we took 20,000 individuals out of UK Biobank and we ran 4,000 Bayesian bootstrap samples. And what we did is we varied the kind of strength of the prior, like how much you kind of concentrate that prior around zero. And again, because computation took about 10 hours on a 40 CPU cores, and this is what you get. You can get these kind of lasso type plots. If you've seen like the kind of Ephra, kind of the lasso, Tipshirani lasso. Here we're kind of looking at the amount of prior concentration around beta. Um, and so here's if you heavily concentrate the prior at zero, it looks like there's no genetic influences on this, on this disease. As we start to relax the prior, we're getting these kind of paths that are coming out. And just to say, so these are valid kind of Bayesian incredible intervals um, that are kind of generated out of the bootstrap model. And again, because we can do this mode jump in, we get this bimodal effect that says, well, with some probability, this, this actual, this marker, this, this gene has no effect uh, on the disease or no association with the clinical outcome. But then there's, other, there's another kind of world that says, well, actually, if the variable is in the model, then we see this. But again, these are kind of what might be challenging for a conventional MCMC to move around. Uh, it kind of rapidly kind of moves around. Okay, thank you. So two, just a couple of slides to, to wrap up. Um, the way we came about this was this, uh, from this background of model misspecification and the traditional Bayesian approaches assume the model's true, in a sense, when, it, when you're doing the updating. The nice thing about using Bayesian nonparametrics 
to do that update. So the non-parametrics to update the parametric model is it doesn't rely on the notion of a true model. It's really important to note that I am not trying to build an approximation to the Bayesian model. I'm just trying to, to build an uncertainty update which has certain kind of relaxes certain assumptions. So we're both kind of actually making inference statements about the same thing, that theta naught which minimizes the KL divergence between your model and kind of nature. So we're both making uncertainty statements on that thing. We're just doing it in a different way. Yeah, so the non-parametric approach is trying to model F directly and then make the uncertainty statements on where's the optimal theta. So I do not expect this left-hand thing to look at that right-hand thing, which is one of the critiques of the weighted likelihood bootstrap. We are targeting the same parameter. We're both learning about the same thing. Conventional Bayes and the non-parametric Bayes are learning about the same object. We're just learning under different assumptions. Uh, in particular, look, conventional Bayes assumes that the model's true and the non-parametric update doesn't. Uh, the other thing is when it works, you know, what are the conditions that it works? You need this conditional independence. If you've got the conditional independence, it's really scalable and trivial to implement on uh, uh, in parallel. Uh, it's also got nice theoretical properties under misspecification. It's got better coverage, uh, and it's got better prediction. Um, on the one view, for very large samples, we're kind of we're kind of using non-parametrics, yeah, to correct for parametric approximations. And another view, if you've got haven't got many samples of the dimension of the model space is very high. We're using param the parametric model, the synthetic data, to regularize the non-parametric update. So the Bayesian bootstrap wouldn't work if you have small samples or very, very high dimensional theta. And we're kind of regularizing that using the parametric. Uh, we're swapping priors directly on theta from like synthetic data or drawing from the prior predictive. And we're replacing MCMC with randomized objective functions. The big caveat is that from conditionally independent likelihood functions. And um, we've got a CRAN package out that can do logistic regression. Thank you. Exactly. Yes. So you're, you're doing this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I mean, you are doing a constructive system of doing this constructive system, and it's conditional on the, the conditional approach. And the claim in principle, I mean, even though it's conditional, in principle, it's a mix of the different conditions. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So to I so, so the question is, um, I'm just being Bayesian, yeah, because what I've assumed is that nature's coming under the is arriving under the Dirichlet process. Yeah. I'm just kind of shifting. Uh, I'm just kind of uh, shifting my beliefs slightly, and I'd say absolutely. Yeah. So this is a it's a it's a Bayesian update. Um, in the non-parametric sense, but it's constructed in order to target the theta. And so it's absolutely the case that my statements of uncertainty on theta are dependent on the properties of that bootstrap. But the theory of the bootstrap, yeah, is really well known. And we've got re and we know that it has really valid properties irrespective of the sampling distribution. So the two theorems that we have, just look at what is the frequentist coverage of this score function. So we're treating this log likelihood now as a score function, and then we're treating this as an estimate. We're kind of like looking at this as an estimator, and we're saying, what are the properties of that? And it says, if you go Bayesian non-parametrics, you get guaranteed coverage for this as an estimator for the theta, and that's the nice thing. But I, I agree that the construction is just saying we're, when we're constructing this posterior for theta, we're just kind of moving up the hierarchy and saying we're going to put a, another prior, but now on the space of distributions, under an assumption that nature is under there. But it inherits the properties of the bootstrap. Okay, sorry. Thank you.